And this gives us a chance to congratulate Joe Theismann, the quarterback of the Washington Redskins. A brilliant finesse pass by number seven, Joe Theismann. Look how quickly he throws that football. And look who's on him, Theismann, who made a big, maybe the biggest defensive play of the game. Joe Theismann is an award-winning former professional football player. In 1983, he was recognized as both the NFL Offensive Player of the Year and the NFL Most Valuable Player. In 1982, he led the Washington Redskins to become Super Bowl champions. Liberty University, put your hands together for the one and only Joe Theismann. Thank you. Thank you so very much. What an unbelievable experience. In my lifetime, I've had the opportunity to play in front of 100,000 people. The excitement and the energy in this room today surpasses that of an audience watching a professional football game or even a collegiate football game. <laughs> to Becca, what an incredible voice, such a small package, but so powerful in our lives. Margo, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I've known your dad for way too many years than either one of us want to admit. But it is truly a pleasure to be with you today. Like I said, I've had the opportunity to speak in front of a lot of different people, but I've never ever thought about a presentation more than I have for you today. Because to me, today really is the beginning of the rest of our lives. The way we walk in Christ, the way we appreciate the Lord, the way the Lord comes into our lives. There are no set plans. There is no true game plan. The Lord sees us as individuals. He treats us as individuals. He assesses us as individuals. But yet ultimately we will all go home and sit in his presence. See, today is a homecoming weekend for you. And I was thinking, for all of us, we have a homecoming. At some point in our lives, we will be given the opportunity to be able to go home. But while we're here on this earth, how wonderful it will be this weekend for Sparky the Eagle to be able to soar high in the skies and for the flames to burn bright. And it'll only happen, only happen if you are present, just as the Lord is present in every one of you. You know, it's funny, we see our lives and so often we see changes that occur. I've had two very significant changes that have really shaped who I am as a person. The first has to do with my name. Margot's kind enough to introduce me as Joe Theismann, and I appreciate that. But I'm really not Joe Theismann. I'm actually Joe Theismann from South River, New Jersey. It's good to know that some of you have escaped as well. And people have heard this story about my name, but yet they weren't sure that it actually occurred. I will tell you the true story. Back in 1970, when I was a senior at the University of Notre Dame, our sports information director called me in the office. He said, Joe, how do you pronounce your last name? I said, it's Thiesman. He said, no, it's not. It's Thiesman. I said, no, it's not. It's Thiesman. He said, no, it's not. It's Thiesman. I said, give me the phone. I called my dad back home in New Jersey. Anytime I ever had a question for my father, he'd always say, fire away, son. I'd dial my dad up on the phone. I said, Pop, I got this question for you. He says, fire away, Joey. I said, Dad, tell me, how do you pronounce our last name? Dead silence on the phone. About 30 seconds goes by, my dad comes on. He says, son, you truly do have a problem. <laughs> You're a senior in college. You know who you are. What have you been doing for the last three years? I said, Dad, that's it. Please just tell me, how do you pronounce our last name? I'll explain it later. He said, it's these, but I hung the phone up, turned to Mr. Roger Valdeseri, our public relations director. I said, Roger, look, my last name is these, but I know. I just got the phone with my dad. He said, Joe, I want to tell you something. There's a trophy out there called the Heisman Trophy. It goes to the best college football player in the country, and we think you have a chance to win that trophy. But we're not just going to count on your athletic ability. Heck no. We're not even going to count on the reputation of the University of Notre Dame, but we think 
by just simply changing the pronunciation of your last name from Thiesman to Thiesman to rhyme with Heisman, we can guarantee you that trophy. And that's how I wound up becoming Joe Thiesman. And people come up to me all the time and say, but you didn't change your name back after you lost. No, I didn't. The reason why is my grandmother was from Germany. And I know there are 90 different nations represented here. What a wonderful worldwide collection of young people in this world. You all hold the future for us in your hands. Do you understand the responsibility that you have going forward in your life? To be here at Liberty, to learn, to grow, to develop relationships, to understand different people, different religions, different nationalities. You are truly what the world will look like and is today. My grandmother, as I say, was from Germany. And so I went to my grandmother, I said, Granny, they're thinking about changing the pronunciation of our last name to Theisman. What do you think? She said, well, I tell you this. Actually, our last name is pronounced Theisman. And that is a bit closer, so I'm okay with it. So the matriarch of our family blessed the changing of my last name. That was the first change that occurred for me. The second change occurred on November 18th, 1985. And if you'd please roll the video, you'll understand what I see. There's a moment of orderly silence before football play begins. Players are in position, linemen are frozen, and anything is possible. Almost in summer weather here mid-November. Then, like a traffic accident, stuff begins to randomly collide. From the snap of the ball to the snap of the first bone is closer to four seconds than five. First and ten, Riggins, squeeze left, back to five. One Mississippi, Joe Theismann, the Redskins quarterback, takes a snap and hands off to his running back. Two Mississippi. It's a trick play, a flea flicker, and the running back tosses the ball back to the quarterback. Three Mississippi. Up to now, the play's been defined by what the quarterback sees. It's about to be defined by what he doesn't. Four Mississippi. Lawrence Taylor is the best defensive player in the NFL and has been from the time he stepped onto the field as a rookie. Will also change the game of football as we know it. And we'll look at it with the reverse angle one more time and I suggest if something can sweep, you just don't watch. And we'll look at it with the reverse angle one more time and I suggest if something can sweep, you just don't watch. Legendary quarterback Joe Theismann never played another down of football. That was November 18th, 1985. The reason I chose to show you that video is because in everyone's life and in your young lives and in your parents' lives, there have been moments when we have questioned the Lord. We don't understand why something has happened to us, or something has taken place in our lives. It just doesn't make sense to us. I want to take you back prior to November 18th, 1985. See, the man that stands before you today, I hope and pray, is significantly different than the man that played professional football. Because as you heard Daryl Strawberry speak, and talk about the great times we had playing the game and the great accomplishments we had in the world of athletics. I was an MVP of the National Football League, the best player in a league. I was a world championship quarterback. That's what this ring stands for. And for any of you that are Cleveland Brown fans, you may never see one of these in your lifetime. <laughs> Sorry, Coach Jackson. But 
But you see, I'd received all the accolades you could receive. I'd received all the pat on the backs. I was the fourth highest paid player in the National Football League, making a million dollars a year. And that was at a time when quarterbacks were worth a million dollars a year. As time has gone on, things changed. We were in the midst of a lousy season, four and four. I wasn't playing well. I had been consumed with the fact that I was great, that I was the reason we were successful. The team could not be successful without me. So I thought. And I'll never forget sitting in my locker and staring at the wall and doing what every one of us in this room either has or will at some point in time, having a heart-to-heart -heart with myself. We'll ask ourselves sometimes, why did I choose Liberty University? Why did I choose these courses? Why did I choose these friends? Why did I choose this relationship? We ask ourselves these questions constantly. The Lord has the answer. Sometimes he makes you work for it. It's not handed to you on a platter and say, here's your answer. But for me, I sat and I looked at that wall and I said, all right, Joe, it's the Giants. It's Monday night TV. What a great, and this is my favorite word, opportunity. It is for you to be able to go out and show the world that that Joe Theismann that you love so much is back. I got up from my locker and I started at this locker room, at that locker room. And as you leave this hall, you see the exit signs. Picture the Redskin logo beneath those exit signs. Not some cute, shiny little star that some people wear. I feel obliged to ask this question at this point. How many of you are Cowboy fans? Okay, understand, it's only a courtesy question. I really don't care. But we used to have that Redskin logo right below that exit sign. And for 12 years as the quarterback of the Washington Redskins, I would run out of that locker room, hit that logo, and never say a word. But on this night, this particular night, I got up from my locker, I started at that locker room, I hit that logo, and I said these words, tonight your life is going to change, Joe. Little did I realize I was into prophecy. <laughs> my world was about to change like I could never imagine. I went out on that field seven for 10 in the first quarter, threw a touchdown pass, I figured, look out world, Joey's back. The Joe Theismann that I love so much is back. We turn to start the second quarter. Coach Gibbs calls a flea flicker. Some of you may or may not understand the vernacular of football. I got up under center, took the snap, turned around, handed the ball to John Riggins, our Hall of Fame fullback. Just as John got to the line, he froze. We should freeze the Giants thinking it's a run. They should all be up here trying to tackle John. He turns around, pitches the ball back to me. I look down the field for what should be a, a wide open Art Monk. He was covered. I looked to my right for my safety valve, Donnie Warren. He was covered. And then I felt some pressure coming from the left side. It was Lawrence Taylor. I slid a little bit more to the right. He grabbed my left shoulder. I swung around. He wouldn't let go. And as LT came around, his right leg caught my right leg between the knee and the ankle. And right off to the left where that piano chord sits, I heard a pow pow. Sounded like two muzzled gunshots. But what I had was an open compound fracture of my lower right leg. I laid there on the field to seem like it was an eternity. And as I opened my eyes, standing above me, Bill Parcells, the then coach of the Giants, is looking down going, Joe, Joe, I'm sorry, I'm going, Bill, Bill, so am I. <laughs> coach Gibbs comes running out and kneels down, looks in my eyes. He says, Joe, for six years we've been together. Joe, you've meant so much to this football team. Joe, this is a heck of a mess you've left me in. I said, I'm sorry. Within five minutes of breaking my leg, I'd seen two people. I'd apologize to both of them. <laughs> and then they started to wheel me out of that stadium. And 55,000 people said thank you to a man who thought he needed absolutely no one. 55,000 people said thank you to a man who thought he could be alone and do it all by himself. And I tell you this, you cannot 
will not, nor ever hope to be a true success in life if you think you do it by yourself. Because the Lord is present in our lives. See, I went through that woe was me period. Why me? Why now? The first year of a $5, a $5 million contract. See, I was hung up in a material world. It was all about what I could possess. It was all about what I could get for me. It had nothing to do with what I could do for someone else. So for a couple of years, I walked around and I moped and I worried and I did other things. And then I started thinking, we are all instruments of the Lord. Every one of us is an instrument. We're here to serve a purpose. We're here to be able to serve the Lord. We're here to be able to work together for his greater good. See, what the Lord did for me is he gave me athletic skills. He gave me the ability to throw a football. He moved me to the highest perch I could be at. He moved me to the top of the mountain, the best in the game, the most recognized in the game. But you see, when I was there, the only thing that mattered to me was what I could get for me. What I truly understand now is as I go out and have a chance to talk to different people around the world, I understand that I am the vehicle. What he did is he blessed me with skills. But then he also noticed that I used those skills and was abusing those skills. And it was time for me to not do that anymore, but to talk about the great graciousness of our loving Lord and the opportunities that he presents every day. Here at Liberty, it's a foundation for who you are. It was founded on Christianity. It was founded on the belief in the Lord. See, you cannot, will not survive in life if you don't have a foundation and a belief. You can build the greatest monuments, they will all crumble at the foot of the Lord because he is almighty. And you know the other thing that the, just is interesting to me so often, people, we, you know, we get in a jam. Sometimes we get in a real jam. And what's the first thing you do when you get in a jam? Oh, Lord, please, please help me out of this. Please, you know, I'll, I promise I'll, I'll, I'll do all good things from now going forward. I really will. And then all of a sudden, it turns out okay. But then something great happens in your life. No one is willing to sit down and say, dear Lord, you've blessed me so much with this opportunity to grow. Things that I've wanted in my life, some I have, some you've given me, some you've granted my way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for giving me a chance to have the most beautiful voice, to use that voice to sing, to be able to teach young men, to be able to minister a university. We're all given skills, but understand they're temporary gifts, and he gauges us as we do them. You see, I, I think about how it influenced and changed my life. See, because for me, I wasn't a nice person, figured that out. Didn't really understand the world of business. I was a football player. Things I talk about, the way I live my life are all based out of the world of athletics. And so when I tried to start my new life, I thought, where do I go? Where do I turn? Education I got. I want to share something from you, for you. And this is out of Proverbs, first chapter, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. If you're not willing to learn, you've got no chance that's why you're here, as Proverbs says. Fear the Lord. Learn. Use the wisdom we have. I acquired wisdom in the world of athletics, and so I went back to that world. I said, how can I start here and build myself a new life? And I started with goals. See, in sports, in every locker room, we write down goals. Every day I go to work. When I walked in that locker room, there were my goals written down. Offensive goals, defensive goals, special team goals. Three areas football teams are broken down into. In business, we all write down goals. It's called our annual meetings, and this is what we need to achieve. 
But yet in our own lives, we don't take the time to make a contract with ourselves. I was reading an article one day on, a mag on an airplane in a magazine. It said that 98% of the people in this world today refuse to take a pen in hand and write down a goal. And I started wondering. In business, we write down goals because that's what we want to accomplish. In sports, coaches write down goals for us because that's what we want to accomplish. But yet in our own lives, we will not make a commitment. We'd rather be a rudderless ship floating from current to current and dealing with situations as opposed to defining where I want to go. I will ask you to do this. Over the next two weeks of your life, take a pen in hand. What do you want? Professionally, personally, financially, and spiritually. What are you looking for in life? Write them down. You'll be amazed how your life starts to go in that direction because it has direction. We were given commandments to follow, written down. Yes, it was in stone, but you could still read it. That's the, we did, that's the thing I'm talking about is it has to be there in front. You have to see it, bring it into this universe. And what price are we willing to pay to be special in our lives? I think of Ronnie Lott, the great safety of the San Francisco 49ers. End of the 85 season, he breaks a little finger on his hand. Doctor says, Ronnie, we operate on that. You'll miss the rest of the playoffs. He's already had three world championship rings. He's already been a nine-time pro bowler. He's already the best safety in the history of football. Doctor says, we if, we, if we operate, you'll miss it. He says, what's my option? He says, we can amputate the upper part of your finger and you'll be able to play. Yeah, well, you hear those stories, and I happened to run into him at a, a golf tournament. I says, Ronnie, let me see your left hand. Yep, nine and two-thirds fingers. Top of the pinky, gone. I asked him my second favorite word, why? Why would you do this? And I told him, you know, you're the greatest that ever played. You're a nine-time Pro Bowl, a three-time world champ, eminent Hall of Famer. Why? You know what he said to me? They wanted me to miss a day of work. He gave up a piece of himself to go to work. Your classes right now are your work. Commit to them. Be passionate about them. And as we've been talking all morning, life is about people and relationships. It's the opportunity to be able to have a relationship. I mentioned to you that I got a little full of myself at one point in time. And we find different ways that the Lord sends people to humble us. I was in Toronto, Canada, a number of years ago. My Canadian loved it up in Toronto. Two of my three children were born in Toronto. And I'm seated at this day as 3,000 people in the audience. I'm the guest speaker feeling mighty darned important in my black tie. They bring out my entree, baked potatoes, six rolls, and give me one pat of butter. I'm decent at management, I'm not that good. Took the butter, threw it on the potato, turned to the young man behind me, said, excuse me, son, I'd like another pat of butter. He said, no. I said, whoa. Time out. I am Joe Theismann. See, all these people have come to hear me speak. I want another pat of butter. He said, sir, I know who you are. You're a great football player. I said, thank you very much. He said, you were MVP of the National Football League. I said, thank you very much. He said, you were a Super Bowl champion. I said, thank you very much. He said, sir, do you know who I am? I said, no, I don't. He says, I'm the kid in charge of the butter. You get one pat of butter. <laughs> I want to share something with you today that I've shared with very few people in my life. The Lord tests us in so many ways. I have three children, Joey, who is 45, Patrick is 37, and Amy would have been 43 years old. I lost my daughter six months ago. And as, as I look out around these sea of young faces, I see her smile, I see her spirit, I see her love for life. I see the bad decisions 
that led to the life she wound up in. And I can tell you as a parent, you ask yourself, what can I do? What did I do? What can I do? What could I have done? And every day of my life, in the last six months, my life is different because Amy has gone to the Lord. She's gone home. But yet, I find visions of her. You see, we're not the only beings on this earth, whether they be eagles or butterflies or some other type of creature. They're all the Lord's creatures. And our spirit lives on. And our soul is a part of us. I think about every aspect of life. I think about the word never. Never, never, it never had any meaning to me before. Now, the word never has significant meaning. I will never get to hold her. I will never get to kiss her. I will never get to love her. She will never get a chance to watch her children grow. She will never get to yell at me again. And by golly, we yell at our parents. I want to say this to every one of you out there, you young men and young women. Your parents love you. They love you unconditionally just as the Lord unconditionally loves all of us. Be gracious to them. Treat them with respect. Love them. Cherish them. Because all they want is for you to do well. You are first and foremost after the Lord in their lives. The pain is almost too much to bear. And you know, I, I asked myself, Lord, why? Why? Why did you take her? Why couldn't you give me a chance to save her? Why couldn't you give me an opportunity to be able to make a difference in her life? Why? The Lord challenges us in many different ways. And we'll challenge our faith and his grace. But yet today, I live on with the smile of my Amy implanted in my mind because it was her joy. When Amy was right, nobody like her. When she was wrong, only the Lord could help both of us. So you're here today, every one of you, to be able to honor, to love, to care about one another. And don't ever forget that the most important person, the most important element of your life starts with the Lord because he sees everything, he knows everything, and before you do it, he already knows what the outcome is going to be. I've never in my life been moved in over 1,500 presentations, over 37 years. I've never been more honored, felt more privileged, to have the opportunity to share with you my pain, my joy, 
my sorrow, just as I will someday to the Lord upstairs. May God bless you and keep you safe in his arms. Thank you so much.